All right, so this is gonna be the last part of the general overview of causes of chest pain. Now, throughout this series, it's gonna be important to remember that these are not every single cause of chest pain. There's a bunch of different causes in each of the systems we talked about, in the heart and the lungs, um, in the abdomen. Uh, so I, I don't want you to sit, think that this is it and uh, there's nothing more because <laughs> there's a ton more. But for our purposes, I want you to focus on these because it, it's the most common and also, um, especially with the cardiac ones and, and, and the pulmonary ones, those are the most lethal. So we're going to start off with the gastrointestinal system and we're going to look at um, GERD first. So what is GERD? So all GERD is, is basically acid reflux. The acid that's present here in the stomach refluxes up the, the esophagus and into the back of your mouth and causes this burning type pain. And, uh, and a lot of times you'll have kind of like a sour or bitter type taste in the back of your mouth. Um, it can cause chest pain because of where, where the esophagus is positioned. So if we think of, um, if we're thinking of the thoracic cavity, Right here, so so this part right here is your diaphragm, this little kind of pinkish color. Your diaphragm is a muscle um, that helps you breathe, but also separates the abdominal cavity uh, with your thoracic cavity. And so um, so above the, the diaphragm is your thorax, it's your chest. And so um, right, behind, right above the esophagus is your heart. And your heart um, is, you know, where you get most of your chest pain if it's cardiac. But if you think about it, if acid is refluxing up and uh, it's causing burning of the esophagus itself, well, if your heart is sitting right here, you can think that that is going to be chest pain from your heart just as much as you would think that it might be from the esophagus. And so uh, a lot of times um, patients that have reflux symptoms, um, they can confuse it with, with chest, pain that, chest pain that they think, you know, maybe their heart. And so um, it's always something that you should keep in mind, um, although you can't, you can't just go straight to saying, oh, it's GERD without doing your due diligence and making sure it's not their heart. So what causes GERD? Well, if we have acid here in the stomach that refluxes upwards, we know that that's abnormal. We know typically your acid should be in your stomach helping you digest food and it should not be going upwards. And so what typically prevents that? Well, it's your diaphragm. The diaphragm, and let me draw this here. If this is your diaphragm right here, and let's make your esophagus and your stomach kind of this pinkish color. There you go. And so if um, if we look at the, the diaphragm, the diaphragm is a muscle. And this muscle um, will contract to help you breathe, but it also creates a kind of like a sphincter. It creates a, a narrow or a, a compressive type um, force on the esophagus so that when when things come when things come down and you're eating it can relax and let that stuff go through but when you're not eating it compresses it inward so that you're not um, having um, contents of the stomach refluxing up and so um, for, and, and you would want that because like for instance if you're working out or even if you're having or let's say you're having a hard bowel movement and you're really pushing down in your stomach well the forces pushing into your stomach uh, would typically make that acid in your your abdominal contents go up if you don't have this sphincter here to to close off that passageway and so the sphincter activity of the diaphragm and the muscles around it are very is very very important and so it, with patients that have GERD, a lot of times it's because of weakness of the lower esophageal sphincter, which is um, this thing right here, the lower esophageal sphincter. And so because this is weak, you're going to allow for the acid to travel up and, and go up the esophagus, causing burning and causing um, acid reflux. And so um, acid is okay in the stomach because the stomach has this lining of mucus that prevents um, the acid from eating away at the actual stomach itself. But your, your esophagus does not have that same lining. And so as acid goes upwards, it damages the esophagus. And that reflux of gastric contents, mostly the acid, is going to cause this burning type pain. And so a lot of times uh, when we would we think of acid reflux, we think it's no big deal. But one thing that we have to remember is if these cells of the esophagus are not used to seeing that acidic, um, that, that acid 
or acidic content of the stomach, the, they can easily be damaged. And so what ends up happening is over time, if you have a chronic reflux and you're causing damage of the esophagus, well, those, those cells might, that are lining the esophagus are going to think, well, I need to change the type of cell that I am so that I protect the esophagus itself. And so that change can sometimes cause something like Barrett's esophagus, where you have that, that change in, in cell type. And eventually, if that continues for a long time, that can cause something like esophageal cancer. And so it's important to treat this. It's not something that's going to kill you right away, but it is something very important to treat and make sure that that um, we we modify kind of the factors that, that would cause uh, reflux to begin with. And so what are some of those risk factors? So we have an increased weight, which makes sense because if you have increased weight, you're going to have more pressure on the abdomen, more pressure on the stomach, causing you to have more pressure inside the stomach, causing contents to want to reflux upwards. Um, you, you have, oh, and um, some people asked, um, will ask like, well, why, if you have an esophageal sphincter here, why doesn't it just reflux downwards and kind of help with the digestive process? Well, because you have a thick muscle here called the pylorus and the pylorus prevents um, food from, from quickly entering the stomach and going out to the, to the rest of your, um, to the rest of your digestive tract. So um, you have these two muscles here that prevent movement. A lot of times, or actually the muscles up here, a lot of times this one's going to be a little bit weaker and it's going to be easier to reflux upwards. The pylorus is actually a pretty thick and strong muscle. Other risk factors, uh, um, aside from the weight, include uh, e eating fatty foods, ca um, increased caffeine intake, alcohol intake, smoking, all of those will increase acid production and they can also increase the, um, the acid refluxing upwards. So what are some of the symptoms of GERD? Well, we, we talked about the heartburn, which is the, the feeling of burning as acid comes upwards. Um, you can also have regurgitation. A lot of times regurgitation um, is thought of to be like a, a, a um, having some of the food contents of the stomach go upwards, but it can also just be acid. It doesn't have to be actual food or anything like that. And so the regurgitation part is what gives you that acid taste in your mouth. Um, the The... Actual pain itself is located in the epigastric region. So what what is that? So if we look at our abdomen right here, and let's say this is your belly button, and um, this right here is your diaphragm, and you have uh, your, um, it's probably the wrong color. So you, you have, let's say, your sternum here, um, and then your ribs, and, right, and up here is your thoracic cavity, so your abdominal cavity. So the, the abdomen is usually broken up into quadrants. And so um, you have a, and it's kind of divided like this. So you have a, uh, a right upper quadrant, a left upper quadrant, a right lower quadrant, and left lower quadrant. And so this is going to be important when we talk about abdominal pain because it'll help uh, characterize what are the different things that can be possibly going on. So... None of these are the epigastric region, but the epigastric region is kind of right here in the middle upper part. And so um, if, you, if you think of where your stomach is going to be, as your esophagus travels downwards here, it attaches to the stomach. And um, if you think of your stomach being in that area, your epigastric region is in this area. So it's kind of like right over your stomach. And so when we say a pain is located in the epigastric region, it's basically right here. And it can also be, if you look at the... Um, the proximity of where the stomach is in relation to, and it's a really bad stomach, in relation to everything else, the stomach, which is going to be right here, is pretty close to the sternum, pretty close to the heart, which is generally right there. It's also a really bad heart. And so because of the proximity, um, sometimes you can have a substernal type pain because it's right here in this area. So aside from um, that burning pain that you, you have, uh, GERD can also cause respiratory issues. And if we think about why um, the, the acid contents of the stomach refluxing up um, will eventually get to the back of your throat. And that's why you kind of taste that, that, that metallic type taste. But if um, we think of the esophagus, let's say the esophagus is here kind of coming down right above that. And we'll put it maybe in like green. Right above that is your, your trachea. And so if acid is coming upwards and refluxing up, well, it can also kind of, as it goes up into the mouth, it can come back down and irritate the airways. And so 
in patients with asthma, they can have um, worsening asthma. They can you can have a cough that doesn't go away, and it's all because of this reflux of of acid going up and into the airways. So um, it can lead to those res- respiratory type issues. Um, uh, it can lead to peptic peptic ulcer disease, and we usually will see that. Um, when we have increased uh, acid production, because as the acid goes upwards, now you have irritation of the of the esophagus, and you can have esophageal ulcers, but you can also have ulcers down here because in the duodenum, it, the duodenum is not it doesn't typically see high um, it doesn't it's not used to these high acid, acidic environments um, because as soon as the acid oops as soon as the acid comes in. Um, your pancreas will excrete enzymes so that it can neutralize the acid. And so if you have a ton of acid coming out and your pancreas isn't able to keep up, you can form ulcers here. And so that, that's kind of the cause of uh, one of the causes of peptic ulcer disease. Um, and so we'll talk about that in a bit. So um, when you ask patients, like if you're, especially if you're confused, if this is going to be your stomach versus your heart, you can ask patients like, is their pain better with ant- antacids or proton pump inhibitors? Um, and antacids are stuff like Tums, proton pump inhibitors are like omeprazole. Um, and the proton pump inhibitor is basically what it sounds like. You, you have, uh, protons like hydrogen, um, ions that are basically what make your environment acidic, right? So, um, the proton pump will, if this is your stomach lining, the proton pump will pump these hydrogen ions up into the stomach to cause the environment to be more acidic. Um, and so if you have an inhibitor, it's going to stop that, that pump from actually working, making your, your stomach environment less acidic. Um, with uh, gastric esophageal ref- reflux disease, it's worse with meals because the meals will, will stimulate a production of acid here. And so when there's more acid, it's going to reflux upwards. And um, if we look at the vitals, generally they're pretty normal. So um, nothing really to see there. So the diagnosis of GERD is usually clinical. There's not there's not a lab test or anything like that that will tell us this is definitely GERD. Um, and so if you get the patient's history, it sounds like GERD. The the exam um, feels like it would be something that, that is consistent with GERD. Then patient likely has GERD, especially if they have the risk factors and all that. But but if somebody is coming in with chest pain and you think it's GERD, you got to make sure that it's not their heart first. So if it's if if it is applicable or it's indicated, make sure you get the EKG. Um, if they're in a lot of pain and you think that it might be cardiac, um, and they're in the ER or in an urgent care that has um, stat labs, you can always get a, a troponin as well. But um, make the the big thing with that is you can't just um, bank on it being GERD if you have a high enough suspicion. And so um, if if it is bad enough, if the GERD is bad enough, and you start uh, with treatment and um, the patient is not getting any relief. So if they if they try the H two blockers or the PPI, um, and they do some lifestyle modifications as well, and it's not getting better, we typically do an EGD. An EGD is an esophago gastro duodenoscopy. Uh, so it's basically uh, getting a camera. It's literally like a almost like a flexible rod type thing. And we put it down the esophagus and we're taking pictures and actually taking a video as we go down. And so we're taking a look at the esophagus. We look at the stomach, look at all the different parts of the stomach. And you can sometimes advance it a little bit farther and, and see a bit into the duodenum. And this is important so that um, so that you can look at to see, one, is there ulcers? Is there anything else that, be, that can be causing the patient's abdominal pain? You can look for um, abnormally abnormal looking tissues that you can get a biopsy of, make sure that there's no cancer. Um, and then if everything looks okay and you, you see some, some changes in the esophagus, maybe you can, um, you can take a biopsy of it and make sure it's nothing dangerous. And so the EGD is important for patients that have GERD that is not responsive to medications. Um, and so uh, that's what I said here. So you can get an EGD if there's no relief with appropriate treatment. And so the appropriate treatment, appropriate treatment is usually um, H2 blockers. It's a histamine blocker um, because there's histamine channels here in the stomach that um, is part of the signaling process of putting acid into the stomach. And we talked about the, the PPI, which is a proton pump inhibitor, inhibiting those proton pumps that take hydrogen ions from here and then um, put it inside the, in the um, belly. 
I mean, in the, in the stomach. And so, um, the, the big thing though, is the lifestyle modifications. And so, um, if anybody comes into your clinic with GERD, you, you want to tell them these things that they can do to prevent, um, the reflux because, uh, the acid itself in the stomach is not the problem. It's when it refluxes upwards into tissues that don't typically see acid that will cause a problem, cause the pain. And so um, if if we think about uh, a patient, um, let's say that they, um, when they're going to sleep, so that's their bed, um, and then they have like a little pillow here. And as they go to sleep, uh, it's gravity all over again. So um, when, when we're standing upright, so the gravity pulls everything down. And so it'll pull the acid down so that you're not, you're not, your, your body would have to, or the acid would have to work against gravity to reflux upwards. But when we're laying down, well, that the, the gravity force is no, no longer going to the feet, but it's kind of equalizing out this way. And so the acid is going to have an easier time refluxing up into the, into the esophagus and into the uh, mouth causing your symptoms. And so what we tell people is instead of sleeping flat like that, they can go ahead and just elevate the head of the bed. Um, I should probably redraw this, but um, you elevate the head of the bed so that you have gravity helping you out still. And, um, and so that can help, especially with symptoms at night. Um, again, no eating before bedtime because you're going to produce more acid as you eat and that's going to reflux up, especially if you're laying down flat. Coffee, alcohol, smoking, and other food triggers like spicy foods, also mint, chocolate can cause um, uh, reflux, and then weight loss. Because again, you, if you have extra weight on your belly, it's going to cause more pressure onto the stomach, causing the contents to reflux upwards. And so if, if we don't adequately treat the, uh, the GERD, every time the acid comes up, you're causing... Um, an insult or an injury to the esophagus, which is a, a tissue type that's not typically, uh, that doesn't typically see acid or it's not designed to protect against acid. Um, there's not that same mucosal lining that we see here in the stomach. And so um, it can lead to cell changes of the esophagus like we talked about before, causing Barrett's esophagus. And all Barrett's esophagus is referring to is that, 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 um, that change of cell type um, and if you, you want to, if you guys want to talk a, a bit more about Barrett's esophagus, I'd be more than happy to, but, um, for the purposes of this class, it's not super important. Um, but like we said before, if you have Barrett's esophagus and it goes untreated for a long period of time, it can eventually lead to cancer. And so that's why it's important to keep an eye on this and treat it well, um, to avoid those type of complications. So next we have peptic ulcer disease, and peptic ulcer disease, or PUD, can be seen as an extension of GERD, um, in that the it, it has to do with the acid of the stomach going into places it's not supposed to. And so uh, acid of the stomach typically will travel downwards, and the, uh, the pancreas will excrete uh, uh, buffers to uh, buffer the, the acid itself, so it's not so acidic for the, the duodenum. And so... Um, when but when we have more acid here in the stomach and it starts to re, uh, go downwards, you can have ulcerations of the mucosa. And if it gets bad enough, it, it ulcerates the mucosa and it can um it can wear at the the muscle layer of the intestine as well. And so when it does that, we we consider it to be um, peptic ulcer disease or or stomach ulcers. You can have it of the stomach lining itself as well, and you can also have ulcerations within the esophagus. Um, and so uh, we usually will diagnose these by, by looking at uh, taking a camera and looking down into the esophagus and noticing the ulcers or traveling down into the stomach and, um, and we can go to the first part of the duodenum and see if there's any ulcerations there. Um, the two main causes of uh, PUD is H. pylori or NSAIDs. And so um, let's talk about NSAIDs first. So well, well, both of these will cause uh, erosion in the mucosal layer, which we talked about. But NSAIDs are your your non -infla your non steroidal anti inflammatory medication. So that's your ibuprofen, um, your or your Motrin, your Advil, Aleve, um, Meloxicam, all of those things. And so we typically use them for pain. Sometimes what I've seen with patients is that they'll have this stomach pain, 
and they they want to get rid of it so they'll take more NSAIDs because they're a pain reliever but it's actually causing the the symptoms to get worse and so what do NSAIDs do well they they inhibit the production of the mucosal layer and they disrupt this layer here making it easier for the acid to attack the actual um the the actual stomach tissue itself and so um if we take too much of them, we are basically setting ourselves up for ulcerations. A lot of times you need a pretty high dose and you need it to be, um, you, you need the, the dose to be given over a long period of time, meaning that you're, you're constantly taking these and you're taking high doses. Um, but in the end it can cause these ulcerations. And, um, if you think of an ulcer, uh, or like your stomach being eaten away by acid, we can imagine that can be pretty painful. And so, um, a lot of times because of the proximity to the heart itself, um, patients can think that this area right here is causing chest pain. And so that's why it's part of the differential for chest pain. And if you want to get into the exact signaling process of how NSAIDs um, can damage the mucosal layer of the stomach, I can definitely do that, but it's probably out of the scope of what we're doing here in this class. And so the, sep the second typical cause of peptic ulcer disease is H. pylori. And so what is H. pylori? Well, it's a bacteria that, it's a, bac it's a bacteria that you can ingest, ingest and it invades this mucus layer um, around the stomach. And so it, it doesn't actually go into the stomach cells themselves. It kind of stays in this, this mucus layer. And so, but it causes inflammation of the stomach itself. And um, that, that inflammation and, uh, can disrupt the production of this mucus and um, increase the, the susceptibility of your stomach lining to some of the acid. It also induces inflammation itself. You, you have the recruitment of inflammatory cells, and that's a whole other process. But in the end, both of these uh, work on decreasing the amount of this protective layer of the stomach. And so um, when you do that, you have a, a um, exposure of the stomach and um, that, that, stomach is, that stomach lining itself is not um, equipped to being exposed to acid for long, long periods of time. And actually, I was not very satisfied with my explanation of uh, the causes of peptic ulcer disease. And, and for the most part, it is pretty correct. Um, and it's a little bit easier to understand um, but looking at the actual mechanism, it's way more complicated, especially for H. pylori. And so if anybody wants um, a copy of the article that I uh, saw, it's, it's basically the one that's on Medscape. Um, but just let me know, I can send it to you. But it's definitely out of the scope of what this class is. So what are some of the signs and symptoms of, of peptic ulcer disease? Well, just like GERD, you're going to have epigastric abdominal pain. And that's that, that pain in the upper part of the abdomen, um, right below the sternum, um, kind of where your stomach is going to be. Um, as opposed to GERD, though, it usually is better with food. And that varies. It's not super consistent. But um, what the, the thought there is that as you eat, you're going to um, have some acid production, but you also have stimulation of the pancreas. Um, and the pancreas is going to produce some of those buffers that are going to seep out this way. And if you have an ulcer here um, in the duodenum, those buffers are going to actually decrease the acidity of the, of the duodenum. And so um, with peptic ulcer disease, you, you usually have kind of that, that, that acid that's seeping in this way. And so that base that's coming from the pancreas is going to help soothe that. Um, and so um, as you eat, you're going to create more of that base to be released, and it's going to make your duodenum feel a little bit better. Um, and the, 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 way, the reason why I say it's not consistent is if you have increased acid production, but you have a esophageal ulcer, that can um, make the, ulcer, that can make the um, ulcer feel worse. And so the pain would sometimes be worse with the food. Um, it can lead to significant bleeding. Um, and so if we think of the, the um, stomach here, we have vessels kind of lining the stomach. And if we erode into the mucosa and it's bad enough, you can erode into one of those vessels. And so now let's say you have a, a vessel right here, kind of right there. Let's say we erode into this vessel. 
now you're going to just be pouring blood in here because the the vessels are usually arteries and so they're under high pressure and so the pressure is going to come into the belly and you're going to have a bunch of um, blood in here now that blood um blood is an irritant so it'll irritate the stomach it'll cause some vomiting but as it mixes with the acid the blood cells themselves break down and you get this seedy kind of blackish um, color and that's what we call coffee ground emesis so emesis just means vomiting and so if you see a person that's vomiting kind of a coffee ground type look it's those that's broken down red blood cells and that tells us that he has some type of he or she has some type of bleeding here in the stomach causing the, the blood to pull in here, sit here a little bit with the acid, and then eventually uh, be thrown up. And um, if you have bright red blood that you're vomiting up, well, that usually is a little bit more serious because that tells us that the bleed is actually very brisk and it doesn't have enough, you're not having enough time for it to mix with the acid. And so you're bleeding and immediately vomiting it up. So that is a bit of an emergency. Now, the vitals for peptic ulcer disease are generally normal. Um, a, and it makes sense because nothing really acute is going on. So the only time that you would have abnormal vitals is if your heart rate goes up. And usually that's going to be because you are trying to keep up with the volume. So, um, uh, going back to like the cardiology of everything. So cardiac output, um, so cardiac output equals heart rate plus stroke or time stroke volume, um, time stroke volume. So your heart rate is basically your heart rate, how fast your heart is beating. Stroke volume is how much volume is being pumped out of the heart every heartbeat. So your cardiac output is how much volume um, is, uh, is being um, pushed out of your heart per minute. And so um, we, our bodies want to maintain a certain cardiac output. And so if our volume goes down, if the amount that we're pushing out goes down, in order to maintain the cardiac output, our heart rate's gonna go up. And so if we think of a very profuse bleed, well, the volume of blood inside your vessels is going down because you're bleeding into an area that it's not supposed to. So with, uh, let's say with a very brisk bleed of the stomach, your stroke volume's gonna go down or your volume in general is gonna go down. So your heart rate's gonna go up to try to maintain that cardiac output because in the end, your brain needs blood. And the only way to do that is to make sure you have enough volume going up. And so um, with, uh, with peptic ulcer disease, the only real time that your vitals are gonna be abnormal is if you have these brisk bleeds that are gonna cause um, your volume to go down. So let's go into the diagnosis and treatment. So it's, um, as opposed to GERD, uh, the diagnosis of peptic ulcer disease is actually with endoscopy. GERD, you can you can usually tell if a patient has the symptoms, they're pretty consistent, you can say, yeah, it's probably GERD. You give them medications, it gets better, confirms your diagnosis. With endoscopy, we, we want to make sure that we actually visualize the, the ulcers. So we will get an endoscopy, an EGD, and a lot of times, most of the time, if we see something, we're going to biopsy it because... Um, it can tell us whether or not the bacteria is present, the H. pylori is present, but also it helps make sure that there isn't a type of cancer. Um, cancers in the stomach can ulcerate and you can have an ulcerating type cancer. And so we, with the biopsy, we want to make sure that there's no cancer there. Um, the treatment overall is the same. Um, if you have a, a lesion that's bleeding, when we go in and do the EGD, they can actually cauterize it or burn it so that it doesn't, so it stops bleeding. But um, the treatment overall is um, lifestyle modifications and then also um, a, a proton pump inhibitor or an H2 blocker. The other thing is um, you can add caraphate, which is a medication that you take that kind of lines the stomach and lines over those ulcerated parts of the stomach so that you um, the proton ions aren't able to attack that part of the stomach. And so um, you can add caraphate as well. A lot of times with the other medications, you the patients generally do okay. Now, what happens if you have H. pylori? Well, you have to the, to treat it like an infection. You have to treat the bacteria itself, and so um, you'll do the PPI, so the proton pump inhibitor, so that you're not um, so you decrease the acid here in the stomach. Um, but you also have to treat with two antibiotics: amoxicillin and clarithromycin. Um, depending on where you live, there might be resistance patterns to some of these antibiotics. I think more specifically is the clarithromycin. And so you can, um, there's a quadruple therapy. Uh, so there's four different medications in that, in that treatment regimen, um, but that's out of the scope of this class. And so the treatment regimen is usually about 14 days. 
And last, we have pancreatitis. Now, pancreatitis is um, inflammation of the pancreas. So the pancreas is this organ that kind of sits in this little pocket of the stomach and the duodenum. And so it sits here because all of these little, I don't know if you can see it. Let me bring, blow it up a bit. So all of these little tracts coming out here um, drain into the duodenum. And the pancreas is responsible of uh, for uh, creating the, the buffers and the enzymes that help break down the food contents of your stomach. And so the food travels down into the duodenum, the pancreas comes and throws out some bases, throws out some, some enzymes um, to, to break down the food, and the food kind of travels on its way down into the, the small intestine and eventually to the large intestine. And so the pancreas is super important um, for the digestion of food. And then also what most people know the pancreas for is for insulin production. The insulin doesn't actually go into the stomach here. It goes into the bloodstream um, and helps uh, your body utilize glucose. And so um, when you have, uh, when you burn out your pancreas um, and it's no longer able to create um, insulin, that's when you get type 2 diabetes. And so... Um, pancreatitis overall is just that inflammation of the pancreas itself. A lot of times it's because of alcohol. Um, so there's two types. There's a bunch, actually, there's a bunch of different types of pancreatitis. The, the two that I typically see is alcohol and stones. And so alcohol, um, the, the metabolites of alcohol are actually toxic to the, to the pancreas and it leads to auto digestion. So if you think of the pancreas as, um, uh, pushing out these enzymes, well, they're enzymes, and so enzymes break things down and uh, and um, are important in certain reactions. And so um, the, the enzymes are used to break down the food products that are going down this way. But um, if they are catalyzing these reactions, um, you can also have a breakdown of the pancreas tissue itself if you're, you're not able to secrete the enzymes out or if they're, they're becoming toxic and you're getting a leakage of those enzymes. And so that's what we mean by autodigestion, that the, the enzymes start to break down the tissue itself because uh, they, they're activating these reactions within the pancreas instead of doing it here in the duodenum where um, it can act on food. Um, the other cause of pancreatitis is gallstones. And so what happens um, with gallstones is here's your gallbladder here. Your gallbladder and uh, your gallbladder basically holds the bile that your liver produces. And so as your liver produces um, bile, the, the bile travels down into these bile ducts and usually it will travel down here um, through kind of this, this common bile duct um, into the area of the pancreas and into the duodenum. And the bile is important for breaking down um, things like fats. And so uh, your gallbladder is important because uh, your liver is constantly pushing out bile. And so some of that bile will come up and sit here in the gallbladder and just wait to have a kind of reservoir of bile available so that when you eat something, especially if it's fatty foods, your uh, the foods will come down. It'll stimulate contraction of the gallbladder, causing bile to be pushed out into kind of a, a bolus and a big push of bile. And so that'll help this food coming down um, be digested. And so if the, if the bile is sitting here in the gallbladder for long periods of time, you can create these little stones. And stones in the gallbladder itself is not anything that is dangerous. What happens in, and what is dangerous is if that stone gets stuck somewhere. So if the stone gets stuck here at the outlet of the gallbladder, well, now you have a, a sac um, in the body that is not able to drain. And every time you have something that's not draining, you're prone to an infection. And so that's when you have gallbladder infections um, like uh, cholecystitis, which is a fancy word for gallbladder infection. Um, but instead, if, if the gallstone doesn't get lodged here and instead it gets lodged right here, well, now you've blocked all of this, the, the, bile, tr the, the bile tree and the gallbladder and all that, but also very important, you blocked this and you blocked the, the um, enzymes and everything from the pancreas, um, and you've stopped it from draining into the duodenum itself. So now you're trying to push all of these, um, all these en enzymes out, and it's being stuck here. You can't move past this. And so the same thing happens where you have auto-digestion of the pancreas. Um, it, and it can get really bad. You can, you can 
eat up the pancreas to the point where all of your pancreatic function is gone. Um, it causes necrosis of the pancreas, which means just basically pancreatic um, cell death. You can get these cysts that become infected. You can, um, it, it can get really, really bad. And if you think about um, all these pancreatic enzymes being dangerous to the pancreas, well, now if they start to seep out of the pancreas and into the abdominal cavity, well, now you're just breaking down everything in the abdominal cavity, and it can get really, really bad. Okay, so that was a bit of an aside. So going back here, um, pancreatitis caused by stones is likely secondary to back up of the digestive enzymes, causing inflammation of the pancreas and causing, uh, you can have that auto digestion of the pancreas itself as well. And then um, alcohol, the metabolites are toxic, leading to auto digestion. There are a ton of different causes for pancreatitis, and we we there's always rare causes that come here into the hospital. So um, it's not always just stones and alcohol, but those are the ones we typically see. And the key, the key pathophysiology involves autodigestion. So you're just breaking down the pancreas itself. So what are the signs and symptoms of pancreatitis? Well, similar to GERD, similar to um, PUD, it's that upper abdominal pain, that epigastric abdominal pain. Um, and in pancreatitis, it typically radiates to the back. About 50% of the time, um, a lot of times that I've seen it, it, they usually tell me that it radiates to the back. Um, if so the, the onset is usually dependent on what's going on. So if you have a gallstone that gets lodged here, well, it gets lodged abruptly and your pancreas is not able to push any of those enzymes out. So that is a sudden pain versus for alcohol, it's, it's toxicity to the actual pancreas itself that's causing that auto digestion. And so that's more of a gradual, um, pain. And so, um, anything that aggravates, this area, so this abdominal area, is going to make the pain worse. So any like exercise or anything or anything like that, any pushing on the belly is going to make it worse. And so, uh, when you do a abdominal exam, they're gonna they're gonna say that they have a lot of pain when you push in that epigastric region. Um, patients will oftentimes have nausea and vomiting. Um, and if you if you think of the reason why, um, your pancreas um, activates whenever you eat something. And so um, as patients try to eat, they will have contraction um, and uh, a pushing out of these enzymes. But if, you, if you're stuck right here, you can't push anything out, you're going to cause pain. Um, and then the same thing you're at, with the um, alcohol, those metabolites are toxic. You start to produce more of those enzymes as you eat. And so you're going to uh, digest a bit more of the pancreas. And so um, that's typically... Uh, so that's part of like the treatment algorithm initially for pancreatitis is that you want to make them NPO, uh, which stands for nil per os, which is a fancy way of saying they're not eating or drinking anything because anytime anything goes into the mouth, it's going to activate this system here. So what about your vitals? Well, you, you typically will have an elevated heart rate. Um, a lot of times it's due to pain. Sometimes with pancreatitis, if you're vomiting a lot, your volume is going to go down. And if you remember, uh, not too long ago, I said cardiac output equals stroke volume plus or times heart rate, times heart rate. Um, and so as your um, as your your volume goes down, your heart rate is going to have to go up to compensate for that. Sorry, that was really messy. Um, and so you'll be tachycardic. Sometimes you'll have an increased um, respiratory rate as well. Um, the physical exam will show typically epigastric tenderness to palpation. So you'll push on that upper part of the belly. It'll hurt. Your abdomen can be distended because of the inflammation of the pancreas and inflammation of the surrounding tissues. And so um, you, you can have something called ascites, which is basically free fluid um, outside of the organs in the belly that is kind of causing this distension um, and causing uh, it can cause a lot of different problems, but it's just free fluid within the abdomen. A lot of times you'll see ascites with uh, cirrhotic patients. Um, if you have a fever and an elevated white count, you have to consider infection because infections with pancreatitis can be pretty deadly and you want to make sure that you're not, you don't have an abscess in there. So, um, which an, an abscess is basically just a collection of pus and, and, and fluid and infection. And so the, the, the only real way to to treat most abscesses is to drain it. So um, if you have a fever, if you have an elevated white count, you have to consider infection and always think of an abscess. So diagnosis of pancreatitis um, is, we clinical picture is important, but we typically get labs. And so 
the lipase is the most important lab. Um, we, we used to get amylase as well, but lipase is more um, specific to the pancreas. And so um, you'll typically have a lipase three times the normal limit. And so um, why is it that we don't use amylase? Well, amylase is also, so both of these actually are um, enzymes that break down food products. So lipase is more focused on fats. Amylase is on complex carbohydrates. But complex carbohydrates are also present, or amylase is also present in the mouth, um, and it's because your saliva glands will produce amylase to break down those sugars. Um, so um, lipase and amylase are both digestive enzymes. Lipase is a little bit more uh, specific to pancreatitis, um, and so we use that more. Um, and then we you typically will also get imaging. We can get an ultrasound, um, but more more often we'll get a CT of the abdomen, and the CT will show inflammation kind of all around the pancreas, and it it makes the surrounding area of the pancreas look hazy. And we'll go over imaging in an additional lecture. So the treatment for pancreatitis is generally supportive. So we just support you as you get better. And the way we do that is we give fluids because people are vomiting, they're losing volume. Um, and so we, we give a bunch of fluids to rehydrate you. And, but we also make you uh, uh, NPO, which no per os pretty much means we're not giving you anything by mouth. Because like we said before, anytime something goes in the mouth, it's going to stimulate the pancreas. There's been recent studies that show um, that the faster you, you transition somebody from NPO to, um, to actually eating something, um, they have better outcomes. So now we used to have a certain number of days that we tell them that you have to be NPO for, but now we just, as soon as they're ready to eat, we start to go slowly, we give them some clear liquids, and we, we go up from there. And then the other thing is pain medication. So um, pancreatitis is very painful. So we do want to uh, we do want to make sure you're not in a ton of pain. So we do give you pain medications.